All right, we are in a political season. And what does that mean? You're going to see a lot of political ads everywhere, online, on television, billboards, direct mail. You're going to see a lot of political ads. So today, I sit down for a very special ad cast with the man behind the message of Mr. Tom Steyer, who is a former presidential campaign. His name is Chad Israel. This is the ad cast. You're listening to the ad cast. This is the ad cast. All right, guys, it's Eric here with the ad cast. The ad cast. Three things that you need anytime you're doing a campaign budget, media, and message. It's very, 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 very important. You're listening to the ad cast. All right, I want to welcome you guys to the AdCast. I have a very busy and a very special guest on the line with me today, Mr. Chad Israel. Uh, for some of you guys who have not heard his name before, Chad was actually involved in a presidential campaign, a very impressive one, too, a very impressively marketed campaign for Mr. Tom Steyer, who ran for uh, president of the United States here and just recently came out. So uh, this podcast is going to be about, uh, you know, all of Chad's experiences as a marketer, and we, he may talk some political stuff too, but you know, you won't hear us saying uh, that we're going for either side here today. So uh, we just want to make that known. Uh, and we just want to welcome everyone to listening in and all our listeners around the world. And uh, Chad, I want to get started, man. So I want to kind of tell these folks a little bit about you uh, and Tell me if I'm wrong here. So prior to joining the campaign, you ha- you were the senior director of social media uh, for over 15 years, and you were managing Fortune 500 companies. So uh, that goes to show you that you know your stuff. You've worked for uh, some of the big brands like Hertz. Folks have uh, definitely heard of that. And you've done some millennial and Gen Z influencer branding, definitely using television uh, and also working in some movie studios as well. Is there anything that I'm missing out in that impressive resume? I, you know, I, I got to give uh, props to where it all started. Um, and my first job was with Alicia Keys. Uh, so back in... 19- Get out of here. <laughs> she was a young, uh, you know, struggling artist, uh, just looking to make that break. Uh, I was lucky. Uh, I like to call myself the lucky kid that landed on the MBK yeah. management team. Uh, Jeff Robinson was her manager and also lo- owner of the label at the time. Um, and again... Full disclosure, I'm a, I'm a retired rapper, so I was a, wow. you know, a, a suburb in, in outside of Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, literally just watching MTV raps in Rap City every day, and I thought, well, you know, why not just be a rapper? Oh, like old school Fab Five Freddy? <laughs> you didn't think I knew about that. <laughs> um, oh, like old school Fab Five Freddy? <laughs> Oh, absolutely. You didn't think I knew about that. (laughs) Eric B is president. You know, life would be, uh, yeah, I think my last uh, social media post was uh, something to the effect, uh, you know, know, Wu-Tang's forever, politics is temporary. Oh, my gosh. Chad, this is going to be fun today. So, yeah, I started with her, and it it was guerrilla marketing. Um, So in college, I was a creative writer, you know, always wanted to tell stories. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, it was uh, really just steeped in, you know, how, like, Again, that's sort of where the rap career sort of began. It's just storytelling, um, you know, ways to bring uh, you know, something simple to life that everyone else can can gravitate and relate to. Um, you know, again, lucky kid ended up in her camp, handing out flyers uh, to get someone to show up, uh, hopefully to uh, one of her free shows. Um, and again, her career progressed. What I was able to see from that that. Yeah, wow. that moment in time, you know, I was sitting out, you know, handing out flyers, guerrilla marketing, slapping up posters at 3.30 a.m. Wow. And social media came out uh, around 2002. I was with another yeah. team and another group. And again, you know, in and out of entertainment and, you know, startup world, you know, you still had to make a, make a living. Yeah. Um, so I started with a, a small company, Ad Outlet. Uh, dot com uh, in that early phase, uh, you know, 1999 to 2001. Yeah, you know, again, rode that wave. Uh, connected with a couple of the uh, the founders of that company and and built that relationship pretty well. Um, and opened up a couple other companies with them. Um, the second one that we did was called Mocuvo, and it was about two thousand three. It was mm-hmm. a flat. Was going big screen, wow. and we had a buddy who was at McCann Erickson, 
and brought us this new device, the new iPod that had a video screen on it. Wow. And if you go back in that time machine, you know, again, everything's big. And we're thinking, you know, 3D, you know, that was an avatar was, you know, uh, becoming the, you know, uh, again, the, 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 the main uh, sort of way that, that, that medium that, that wow. at least, you know, the, the entertainment medium was starting to shift into these enormous screens. So it was very wow. counterintuitive that content's going to be consumed in the palm of your hand. But a group of us got together and we thought, you know, hey, everything's going to be in these snack size bites. You're going to consume everything at home on your large screen. You're going to like want to take pieces of that with you when you're having your, your, your commute to work. Um, and then we started to see as free screens would become fragmented, mm -hmm. how then as marketers do we start to reach this audience? And again, that's when millennials were still teenagers watching TRL and mm -hmm. uh, drinking Mountain Dew Code Red while playing two video games and still doing an IM chat at the same time. So we saw this multitasking yep. that we've never seen before. Not my generation, Gen X, and definitely not my my parents are the you know the the greatest generation. Yep. So we saw the generational shift, and again, how wow. how mediums uh, were just now becoming fragmented like we had never seen before. So as wow. market, how are you going to get in front of that wave? And so I was with uh, you know, a group at the time, uh, some visionaries, some old guys with some money, and I like to say. I was old enough because I was in my early 30s to explain what social media was um, and to the money guys. And then I was still young enough to the kids that I wasn't some old creeper that was there who shouldn't. It was just, again, we it was luck, age. Chad, you are my brother from another mother, man. I, I'm that old guy who, who gets it and I'm not creepy. You know what I mean? <laughs> You're my brother from another mother. So all that sort of, uh, you know, all that activity. Uh, first, again, this is when social media first started. And mm -hmm. again, I got into this because we were filming a reality TV show. We had a limited budget and I went to MySpace to do the casting because I didn't want to spend half of our budget on a traditional casting agency. Mm -hmm. Help and Breath just wanted 20 girls to show up. Um, and it was for a TV show called Hot Wings. It was like Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, but we had three hot girls making over a guy who just made it and got to LA and Tried to you know send him on his way to his dreams. Right. Uh, we had over 200 women show up for that that uh, casting call. Uh, the owner of uh, you know again the Mocuvo, uh, which it later became, but um, he was a financier of that reality show. Just wanted to know how I got all those people there. Um, that's when again that conversation with McCann Erickson started. Next thing you know, we've got a, a angel financier from an ad agency in Columbus, Ohio that drops three million bucks in our, our lap to, to develop what we're doing. So went to Col went from L.A. to Columbus, opened up a green screen room, first started to you know, just make 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 content. Um, right. That's when we started working with YouTube creators like Dan Zappin, um, who later becomes the owner of Maker Studio and sells that for, I think, like 50 million bucks. Well, back then we were just making videos in a closet. Um, we were just some creators with a vision and, and some – and some high def cameras mm -hmm. and now YouTube opened up and provided an outlet for creativity. So again, at that time I was also in product placement because doing that reality show, we laced it with uh, as many products as we could. Like sodas and whatnot or our alcoholic beverages. Yep. So our, basically our, our, our $25,000 little pilot that we did was loaded with about $150,000 worth of brand integration. Mm -hmm. So we started to see that model where if we can start to, again, put products inside these little videos, you know, little little things here and there. Um, yeah, at first it was just a brand slap. You might just have a watermark on it or have some ownership over that content. But I work with brands to try and figure it out. So again, long story short, back in 2003 to about 2016, that's sort of the world I was in. Just agencies working with big brands like you know, Toyota, Microsoft, Lexus, mm -hmm. um, Angie Amato, uh, you name it. They pretty much just came out of the woodwork. I uh, helped them, uh, again, just with strategy, getting started. You know, Chick-fil-A launched the first uh, Cal Appreciation Day with them. You know, set up their whole social media uh, sort of strategy and network um, you know, all the way back in 2008. Um, always, always, always have had a passion for politics. Man, it, it, what's, so, what's so weird, man, um, and, and it's it's not weird, but more interesting than anything is like 
it's almost like you, you become better marketers when you've gone through some of the avenues that you went through, like the guerrilla marketing, putting up posters at 3 a.m. in the morning or working with an artist in the beginning that no one knows or believes in just yet. And you're having to do these things because you don't have the revenue or the dollars behind you to be able to do it yet, you know? So, I mean, it's, it's, it's just an interesting road, man. So let me kind of, let me ask you this. Now you said you were leaving off and you said that you were always interested in politics. So, I mean, I've heard the musical in, I've heard the beginning stages of social media when MySpace was kicking in and everyone's page had like a musical song behind it. So what, what got you into doing the marketing for political people or being in politics period? Yeah, I, it was the first, uh, again, I think it was the first uh, wave, 2008, uh, seeing the surge that Obama had um, versus even Hillary Clinton in the primary. Um, mm -hmm. And seeing mm -hmm. how he was utilizing Facebook and MySpace in a way that was different um, because it was an enablement. Yeah. It wasn't anything that he necessarily or his team created, but just by putting the the just his brand and that ethos and allowing creators to work with it, it was like the movement shaped his message. Oh, yeah, it was I like agree. The and brought him to the prominence of what he was able to 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 do. Um, and I think again, from Hillary's side, from Hillary's campaign, was just uh, dumbfounded because uh, you know there. I think step into digital media was buying some digital ads and and an email campaign, uh, where his was more of an organic life. And yeah, it probably makes sense as I got more exposure in politics, understanding uh, community organizing. Mm -hmm. um, I any no knowledge of what that meant back in 2008 um when you know that was all like again i remember back then it was just oh he's a community organizer he can't yeah. do anything after seeing from the steyer campaign how important and how powerful community organizers are i real realized that to your point the folks that are actually doing things without a budget without like you know the 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 you know, the, the tactical sort of you know execution tool belt that some of us have when we when we get right. budgets. Mm -hmm. I'm an expert. You're learning, you're figuring it out, and it's passion and it's energy. Passion and energy are so valuable to yes. any, any any business, any movement, anything, um, and it translates. So it's one of the key things that I, I started to see when it came to this dynamic in politics and, and branding. Um, and I've got another you know, influencer friend that I've worked with called, you know, his name's Carlos Gill. Um, and he does a, a really unique presentation where he, he shows how brands are envious over, you know, again, celebrities like DJ Khaled or mm -hmm. the Kardashians uh, and brands envy, you know, that, that, that following that again, Drake puts out a video and then you've got 20 million people the next day doing their own version of a video. I mean, that's brand salivate at that type of mm -hmm. passion around, uh, again, their message or again, their, know, their product. product, their product. And guess what? The reality is no one cares. You, you know what no though? It, the it, thing in the morning, see what their brand posted on social media. So, you know, those, those realities that brand marketers don't necessarily like to hear. Yeah, and again, I was you know paid a great salary at a big corporation. I I heard it because I understood it, and I knew that was true. I didn't keep on drinking the Kool Aid from the brand side because it's just hey, everyone's going to love this flash sale. No, they're not. You're going to love the flash sale because it's going to keep you employed for another quarter. Yep. But again, that that short term vision is where I see still again the reason why the coronavirus and this outbreak is really affecting so many companies because they're not. Yeah, really financially you know, responsible. Yeah, it just you know, call it what it is. But if you're, you know, uh, hey, don't get me started on that. Track. Well, you but, know, yeah, it's, it's it's a different way. That, you know, if we if you think this. about it, what we're talking about now, there are so people there. There are so many people and companies and brands. They are so traditional in their approach that they're going to be left behind because, and then they won't. They'll feel out of touch, right? So like while you were talking and I started just thinking about something that I always say to people is that traditional media is about the width of your wallet. It is what you can buy. The new media, the way we think, it's about the width of your brain. Like 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 saying that flash sale. Yeah, it's great right now and it'll keep you employed, but truthfully, that's not what the market wants. You're not speaking to them anymore. You're shoving a product down their face. You you don't have their attention, and then they're gone. 
you, you know what I mean? And it's like when I I'm going to talk about like the, the the Tom Steyer campaigns, and and you said a word earlier. You said bite sized pieces. Every time my wife and I turned on YouTube or we were doing something, those bite sized pieces. They came up in front of us. And I want us to talk about those bite sized pieces, but we're going to take a break in just a minute. Okay? When all eyes are on you, make it count. From audio and video to graphic design and more, Craft Creative can do it all. We don't make commercials, we craft creative. See what we can do for you at WeCraftCreative.com. All right, this is Eric here with the AdCast. I am with Mr. Chad Israel. If you've been listening to the first part or before we went to break, you got to hear about how Chad actually worked with Alicia Keys, how he was in the music industry. The guy was putting up posters at 3 o'clock in the morning to running a presidential campaign. You don't get there by not putting in the work, right, Chad? That's it. That's Again, it. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, it no, it's no secret. It's yeah. uh bit of uh, rolling up the sleeves and putting some grease on the elbows and and hopefully those sharp ones don't don't cut too many people that's right so now before we were talking about uh bite-sized pieces and and over the break i was kind of telling you about uh how every time my wife and i we would get on facebook or any of the medium that has our attention i would see the tom steyer ads and i even had a client of ours talk about tom steyer ads but they were always short straight to the point bite-sized pieces so not only were you getting the reach, you were getting also frequency out of it, right? Did they serve you well running those bite-sized pieces of ads? Well, again, you know, full disclosure and full, uh, I, I think, transparency. Um, the end goal wasn't uh, necessarily achieved. Um, so there was a, a really targeted strategy in those ad buys, Um Again, he was riding the coattails of the the impeach Trump movement that mm -hmm. pretty much began uh, around 2017. Um, you know, started to get I think some national awareness around his name because again he was tying himself in those ads, taking ownership of them. You know, so there was a I'd say a base layer um, that that he sort of uh, created a nice little foundation for him to build upon the state operations. Yeah, those state operations. To your point. Uh, when I saw the media plans, I was very impressed uh, just from a marketing standpoint because it was truly a 360 surround sound. You know, because they were so well funded, they left no stone really unturned when it came to you know, how do you really pervade the, the, the media space that's available. And I almost call it the oxygen theory. Mm -hmm. Oh, you just go in and you take every piece that's available and almost in a way – if he did have a rival, now Bloomberg was, a, I think, an unforeseen factor, and mm -hmm. I probably make a guess that if Bloomberg hadn't entered the race, you know, Tom would have had even more viability. Because mm -hmm. um, again, it's funny when you're talking billionaires, you know, Tom worth a couple, and then Bloomberg worth sixty. I mean, it just that that type of uh, you know, let's just say uh, wallet really casts a shadow over yeah. everything Tom was willing to do. And what Tom was doing was like unprecedented you know 150 million dollars in the primary um and to your point the snack size bites when it came to that 360 media plan it was really supposed to be a full surround sound um so again everywhere every device everywhere you look and it was really to build the name recognition right so if you think about that number one thing that politicians really bank on is that name recognition and that's really the traditional sort of primary system. Iowa and New Hampshire are isolated to then give a candidate who might not necessarily have the funds. It, they, they, they reward them for the effort. To your point, the hard work. Right. So now you've got an ability to, with these devices, with the way that you can distribute content this day, yeah, you can show the world. And I found that a job because, again, he had video crews embedded uh, with a lot of different teams in Iowa. Um, mm -hmm. Again, that content was feeding some of the national teams as well. Mm -hmm. And a lot of content uh, from a standpoint of how do you break this down into issues that really matter to the state? And that's probably why in South Carolina you saw a lot of uh, messages that related around – you know, issues that affect, you know, folks in South Carolina, the environment, you know, knowing how the, the coastal sort of plain right. on the east of the, you know, the, the state, 
you know, you think about global warming, rising temperatures and sea levels, you know, how is that going to affect, you know, the people that live in Charleston? How is that going to affect the people that live on that side of the state? And then, again, when it came to other issues, criminal justice reform, um, you yeah, know, again, I, from from Tom's perspective, uh, running, I, I think he probably should have doubled down a little bit more when it came to uh, you know, appropriations. Um, you know, there he was really from a standpoint of uh, taking a lot of liberal stances, but able to do it from a standpoint, hey, I'm a billionaire who's a pure capitalist, I'm not a socialist, but I can take some of these issues and merge them. Um, well, he, again, did, he did good, uh, you, you know, taking the political result out of it. What impressed me the most was his marketing. That impressed me. I thought it was more, I, I thought he did better than everyone else in terms of marketing. Um, you know, that that end of it was it was so impressive. And I think like the bite sized pieces, when people are saying on social media, I, I'm Mark Safe from Tom Steyer ads, you made an impression. Right. Reg regardless if you got the vote or not, from a marketing standpoint, you made an influence. You know what I mean? Do, do you think like social media, like we talked about Barack Obama using it in 2008. Do you think social media has forever changed politics now and will social media start getting more money than television because almost like if you wanted to win an election you go to television now it's like you have to have that social media presence so here's the and again i think uh joining the steyer campaign was somewhat of an anomaly when it comes to the sort of political uh arena i'm um, talking to some of my friends who've been on other campaigns that weren't cash strap you know weren't cash flush they were cash strapped you know, they had a different perspective when it came to their strategy, when it came to what they were able to do. Um, even from the brand marketing side, I was jealous uh, when I saw how free and open the budgets were. Not just the budgets, but the ability to tap into them. You know, yeah. Not a lot of red tape, not a lot of uh, you know, um, uh, uh, just policies and procedures and approval processes to go through. Uh, there was empowerment. So I think that was a key element as well because – he also sought to bring in people who weren't necessarily just political politicos. Um, so folks like me that were you know, in the social media space it was a hybrid between communications and digital and how I could combine those two. Um, you know, there were some people like us who really were empowered uh, within the organization just to take free reins and go. Um, and again, day one, we just had the we had a, uh, you know, uh, uh, Ten thousand dollar a month uh, social media budget per state just to boost Facebook, just to boost Facebook ads. Man, uh, yeah, you know, from a, a ten billion dollar corporation, I, I had to go through like three levels of approval just to get a thousand dollars to boost wow. a single post. So again, I think Tom's perspective and, and, and his team were able to merge, you know, the traditional uh, sort of you know political checklist. But combine it with the expertise and know-how to to move the dial, if you will, uh, when it came to the media space. Um, and again, just uh, from to your point, from looking at it from a marketer, mm -hmm. he he did it right. Um, now the the challenge is, you know, not every politician has access to those types of funds. So uh, to your point, getting back to how Obama was able to leverage almost what I would call the free wave of social media, the organic side. Yep. With Trump in 2016, you know, social media shifted and it changed uh, since 2008 um, and then even 2012. So you know, what had happened on these social networks, they no longer became social networks. They became ad networks. Uh, exactly. Facebook is not a social network. I hope that's not a newsflash to anyone listening to this broadcast. Twitter somewhat still has that organic space because, again, you can capitalize on the zeitgeist on the moment. Instagram, uh, you know, virtually no organic reach except for the Giphy store, except for GIFs. Um, mm -hmm. There's still some organic elements that you get with that. But these are paid networks. These are paid me these are media conglomerates that want your dollars to move a message. And, again, Facebook's still free. You can go open up a you know, And that's just the nature of these platforms. And that's where the Trump's team took advantage of knowing how Facebook had shifted. Yep. So I think I think Hillary's team still looked at that 2008 playbook and thought, well, all we got to do is get people to say nice things about us on Facebook and we'll win. 
you know, there was this whole other side when it came to manipulating the the advertising out al the algorithm itself when it came to ad dollars and how those again how Facebook was operating with that news feed. It would mix in paid posts with organic posts, and you know the public didn't know what they were seeing. So there was an ability to leverage those platforms in a way to their benefit, and I see that shift right now. You know, real time marketing. <clears throat> is a very unique space and it's one that you know, again I was trying to get a lot of things done uh, on the styre side but from the brand side it's all you know what doesn't cost anything to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a person you yeah. don't have to inject money into it does does it cost paid media all you need is a real-time marketing team you know and some tools in place to you know, have your listening capabilities and monitoring uh to to enact and activate those conversations in real time I see it as a unique opportunity for someone to jump in the space, especially when you've got so much vitriol. Yeah, it, so much. Referee. Now, we need someone to be an adult in some of these you know, Twitter streams, and I, I fall victim to it as well. I, I get baited, and I'm in. Next thing I know, I'm 20 <laughs> tweets. And I'm like, why am I wasting my time on right, this? Right, right. And there's a, a, there's a unique space to really like go back to the basics, if you will, as everyone's really playing in that paid media space. You're going to hit a point of diminishing returns. There is even on the internet. There's uh, there's, there's a finite space of, of inventory that's available to to be leveraged. Um, but again, there's there's nothing that's going to cost you to have a conversation with someone. And I think it's that one on one capability that social media does uh, provide. To your point, that's where I think the future in the next again blocks of campaigns are going to be how how politicians really just get real. And it's like that Alicia Keys analogy. You know, being able to if if I could have had my space, you think I would have been sitting out, you know, like at, at, at you know Times Square at six o'clock, you know, every day handing out flyers to get someone at, at yeah. a ten o'clock show, yeah. or you know, posting up you know the posters at, on the subways, um, you know, at three a.m. I could have sat there at home, pushed a few buttons, and called it a day and been onto something else. I, I here's what I want to do. Um, I want people to listen to this episode and what we're saying, because I think we have so much more that we can carry it over into another. In Vegas, when uh, the Democrats were actually doing the debate and Trump was in Vegas, I was in Vegas at the time. And Brad Parscale, I hope I'm saying his name right. You you know him. He he was at, he was him and Jared Kushner, and they were actually inside of the, the hotel where we were going to this event, and he was actually a speaker at the event. And you got a chance to ask him some questions. And on episode two, I want to discuss that with you and what he said. And it ties into everything that you're saying right now. So we're going to end episode one right now. And I'm going to encourage everyone to take a listen to episode two. Because this is this is too hot for, for radio. I think you and I are burning up these microphones right now, right? All right, Chad. So we're going to end this episode right now. Uh, everyone... We have to end it. It's too much. It's too much heat for the microphones right now. Chad and I are going to come back, uh, and we're going to give you another episode. So episode two. So stay tuned. All right. This has been the AdCast. If you feel this podcast has been a help to you or could be a help to others, please don't forget to subscribe. You can listen to our podcast anywhere, iHeart, Spotify, Apple Music, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And this episode is also going to be available on YouTube. To catch up on past episodes, go to heyimeric.com, or you can always text me at 843-483-1555. This podcast is brought to you by VIP Marketing and Advertising. You don't need a marketing agency. You do deserve very important placement. VIP Marketing and Advertising is a cutting-edge strategic digital, creative, media, and marketing partner that provides services for businesses of all sizes. To stay up to date on the latest marketing news, subscribe for email updates at veryimportantplacement.com.